This is Ember. It's the most badass high-speed camera humankind has ever seen. It's capable of continuous recording at a maximum resolution of 5K. Today I'll be doing an overview video going through all the details and features to help you get up and running. I'd like to start off talking about the accessories that are available for Ember. In the box, there are a set of standoffs for the battery plate, as well as a DTAP power cable and a USB-C transfer cable. We also offer a NATO ecosystem to mount monitors, as well as handles, and anything else that's NATO compatible. There's a neat feature about our monitor mount that I'd like to show off. It comes pinned for both small HD as well as airy, so you can remove whatever pin you don't need. Then when you remove that pin, there's a nice little spot to store it right behind the back of it. We recently added a new filter for Ember. It's the IR filter. We made a video demonstrating its capabilities as well as how to install it, and you can check that out in the link in the description. This provides a very unique perspective as it only captures IR light and cuts out all the visible light that the human eye normally sees. For powering Ember, there are plenty of options. It can receive a voltage range from 12 to 30 volts, which allows you to use regular DTAP batteries that are usually 14.8, all the way up to a 6S LiPo. So for example, on my FPV drone, I power it directly from the flight pack without any kind of voltage regulator, which makes for super convenient lightweight setups. All of these specs are also listed on our wiki, so go check that out if you have more questions about power. We also make an AC adapter for Ember to keep it running on the bench when offloading footage, or if you're using it in a studio environment, you can find this on our store as well. All right, let's move on and talk about the menu system for Ember. We're gonna first talk about the HDMI menu and then move on to app control later. On Ember, there is a power switch, a record button, a select button, and an encoder wheel that has no detents for seamless interaction with the menu. So starting at the top here, there's two buttons. There's an X and a playback button. The X will clear the UI, leaving you with just a clean feed from the HDMI. To come back to the menu, just simply press the select button again. You'll have options for width and height for resolution. There's 5K and 4K options. Here, this is the recorded FPS. We have a few options here. There's max and user. User can adjust the FPS all the way from one, all the way up to the max FPS for the selected resolution. Next, there's a shutter angle. Play around with it yourself to see what works for you. But when you're shooting high speed, shutter angle matters a little bit less than 24 FPS in terms of motion blur. Moving over, we have ISO. Ember has options for one, two, and 400. It's important to note that these are all analog gain happening at the sensor. So there's not a big noise difference between the three of them. We then have color profiles. There are two options on Ember currently, that's Rec. 709 and HLG Beta. HLG Beta is a flatter color profile, which provides a little bit more dynamic range. There's white balance, which can be adjusted from 2000 to 9600. You have the options to do tint, that's adding green and magenta to your image. Next, we have project FPS. This is not the recorded FPS, this is the playback FPS. So if you shoot 600 FPS and play it back at 24, that's 25 times slower than real time. We have options for drop frame equivalents, such as 23976, and this can go all the way up to 120 FPS. There's options to control the fan. You can do low, medium, and high. In the low setting, the fan will shut off if it can. Keep in mind that if the camera needs to, it will turn its fans on to keep itself cool. The power options can be used to adjust the cutoff as well as the warning voltage. By default, it sets 12 volts at a warning and 10 volts as a cutoff. This is pretty standard for V-Lock batteries and DTAP power supplies, but if you're using it on a 6S system, such as an FPV drone, these can be adjusted to set custom values. Moving across the top, there's time settings, so you can adjust your date and time. Then there's the option for format. You can set your cam letter and your real number. You have default settings. You can turn your Wi-Fi on or off on Ember. Normally when you boot up Ember, it can take about 20 seconds for the Wi-Fi network to come up. There's a little indicator down at the bottom of the screen. There are four channels available on Ember. There are three listed at five gigahertz and a 2.4 gigahertz network. The five gigahertz are better when you're closer to the camera for low latency. But if you're further away from the camera and still need to access it, the 2.4 gigahertz network can do a better job. Moving over, you see the SSID and IP. This will be the network name of your Ember. All right, let's dive right into playback. Scrolling back across the top, there's a little button showing the play icon. If you select that, it'll bring you into playback. Inside playback, the first setting that's available is your clips. So you can scroll through and select whatever clip you want to preview. Once you've selected it, if you move over, there's the play and stop button. Once the clip is playing, you can use the encoder wheel to increase and decrease the rate of playback. This can provide some really cool options for speed ramping and previewing clips on the camera. Next to that is the ability to increase and decrease frame by frame. So if you just select into that menu, you can now increase or decrease with the encoder wheel to get some really fine tuned control. All right, that just about does it for the on-camera control. Let's move over to the app side of things to show you control and trimming there. For this video, I'll be using the iPhone 15 to control the Ember. 
via wireless and via wired. You can also use a select set of devices from Apple. We have a list on our wiki you can check out. When you boot up your Ember, as we mentioned earlier, you can see if your Wi-Fi network's on or off, depending on that little emblem at the bottom. The first time you connect it, it'll ask for a password. The default password is Ember 5K600. Once you're connected, just go ahead and open the app. Up at the top left corner, you'll see the button to connect. Under this connect button, there are options for Wi-Fi control as well as Wi-Fi playback and export. Go ahead and exit there. And you can see we have control of all of our settings on our Ember. Resolution, FPS, shutter angle, white balance, ISO. These can be adjusted and will real-time update on the UI on the Ember. When you select playback, you can see all of your clips in your media pool. One of the coolest things is that the UI on Ember will also update real-time as you control stuff on your phone. You go ahead and add a marker, that's the center button here. That then gives you an in and out point to adjust. You can either adjust by dragging around on the timeline and then selecting the in and out, or you can select the playhead and adjust it there. To increase and decrease the rate at which you scrub, say you have a clip that's super long, but you need to be able to finally select a single part of it. If you tap on the actual video itself and scrub from there, there's some fine control up at the top and it gets less precise as you move down towards the bottom. Once you have in and out set, just go ahead and add it to your queue. When you're in the queue, you'll have options for resolution, codec, frame rate, and the destination. Under codec, you'll have different options such as H.264, HVEC, or different flavors of ProRes. Frame rate is not the recorded frame rate. This is the project frame rate like we talked about earlier. Under destination, you have options for photos, files, and other. Photos will go to your photo album on your iPhone. Files will allow you to select an SSD or different locations on your iOS device. Other will give you options such as Dropbox, Google Drive, or AirDrop. You can export over Wi-Fi, but I highly suggest using a USB-C device connected to Ember directly. We're going to go ahead and look at exporting over USB now. Instantly, you can see on the Ember preview that it says USB 3, detached to record. Underneath your connect settings, you'll see the options for Wi-Fi. Just go ahead and move it over to USB-C. And then down here at the bottom, it says connect to USB. We're going to select that, and then select the Ember drive you want to start previewing. Gonna go ahead and exit out of that dialog and then go back to the playback screen of the app. And now, because we're connected via USB-C, you see this little option down next to the marker with a stabilization button. It'll open up a new menu with options for smoothing, crop factor, and lens focal length. This clip, for example, was shot with a nine millimeter, so I'll be entering nine. And then I'll adjust my smoothing and my crop factor to the settings I like. Crop factor is how much it can crop, and smoothing is how much stabilization will be applied to your shot. Up at the top here, there's a little slider for on and off to turn the stabilization on. And then at the bottom, you can click stabilize. You get a little loading bar there. And now we have a little preview on our screen. The yellow frame is our final output and the red frame is the original. If we exit the stabilization page, back on the marker screen, you can see that the stabilization button is now green, showing that it's been turned on for this selected marker. If you'd like to go adjust settings, just simply tap on that icon again, and it'll bring you back to the page. All right, so we've got that selection set. Now let's add it to our queue again go to the export queue. And this is all the same as we talked about with the Wi-Fi settings. You can select your resolution, codec, frame rate, and destination, and then just go ahead and export. So there's a few options for trimming. Like we just showed in the app, that gives you pretty awesome seamless trimming. You can also trim in QuickTime, and you can also trim in DaVinci or any of your NLEs that you like to use. The beautiful thing about trimming in the app or trimming in QuickTime is it preserves the metadata in case you want to stabilize clips in the future. So let's go over how to trim in QuickTime. It's as simple as going to edit, and then right here you have a trim. There's also a shortcut, command T. It opens up this new timeline with a yellow bar around it. You can drag your in and out points to the parts you want to select. I and O are also quick shortcuts to set those in and out points. So if you hit I, it'll set the end point for you, and then you can play your clip forward, and then select O, and now you have a selection. When you hit trim here, it'll give you a new window with the new video. And to save this, you can hit Command S or go File, Save. All right, so that's all the trimming options. Let's show you how to update your camera. With a well-charged battery, you'll want to start with your camera off. You go ahead and press and hold the Select button, which is the oval button above the record, and turn the camera on. It'll flash white and then give you a blinking standby green light. Go ahead and connect your camera to your computer using a USB-C cable. And we now see a drive called Ember Firmware. This is a separate partition from where all your footage is stored. Don't worry, your footage is still there. This is just now in bootloader mode. Go ahead and open that drive. There are two folders in here, FW, which stands for firmware, and WCAL, which is what we use to calibrate your camera before we send it to you. You only need to worry about FW. Go ahead and open that folder. On our wiki, you can find the latest firmware for Ember. 
You can just download that by clicking here. Once you unzip that, it'll produce a file called ember.bin. You just need to drag this file to the FW folder and you're ready to update. But first, there's a couple things I need to mention about this process. The file that is in FW needs to be titled ember.bin and nothing else. The camera's looking for this file, so if it's anything else, it'll fail and give you a red light showing that it's not working. All right, let's move on. So we have ember.bin in the firmware folder. You're just gonna go ahead and tap that select button and the camera will start to flash rapidly. This can take about one to two minutes to update. And when it's done, the camera will reboot into its normal mode and the HDMI screen will come back on. Another fun feature of Ember is you have the ability to trigger it through the GPIO. We have documentation and wiring diagrams in our wiki, of course, and we'll make a separate video about this in the future. It's a little bit more detailed how to set one of these up yourself. There's also Mutiny that started to make trigger cables. There are also a ton of other third-party companies that have made accessories for Ember, such as cages and lens mounts. I have the Revolva system, of course, here from Kipper Tie. They also make a lightweight PL and a regular PL. And then on this camera, I'm running a C7 adapter for Leica M. They also make an RF mount, an EF mount, and an Icon mount. Salty has made an amazing underwater housing for Ember, and it's compatible with their ecosystem, so all of their lens ports and their monitored housings will also work with it. We've seen some amazing shots come back from this, so definitely go take a look at those. They're in the reel from December. Some other things I must mention about Ember. This year, the gimbal team put an Ember in carbon, so that's 32 to 192 millimeters, five axis stabilization, all the way up to 1,011 FPS. It's quite a package. Also, when we were choosing new colors for Ember, from green to gray, Charles had a little fun and created a camera that we call the Capricin camera. Finally, I need to mention that we integrated the Ember into our GSS. We are now offering this as a rental option for those that want 50 to 1,000 millimeters of zoom at 5K, 600 FPS. All right, that'll just about do it for this video. I hope you learned something. And of course, if you have more questions, reach out to support at freeflysystems.com. Have a happy holidays, everybody.